Hello and welcome to Northeast Christian Church online service. We are so happy to have you with us. Please be sure to follow NECC on all social media platforms. And to listen to all our past messages, follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the service.
years old my father died and when he died man he left a lot of unfinished business and I remember being in my church sanctuary just me just God cry, praying crying my heart out it's just a sea of bitterness and I heard God say rise up Mary Evelyn now my whole life I had been gone I had been known as Mary the only person that called me Mary Evelyn was my father and so I thought maybe God was calling me Mary Evelyn because that's what my dad called me and it brought me a lot of comfort and so I started going by Mary Evelyn, Mary Evelyn and it wasn't months till months later that I did research and I realized Mary means sea of bitterness from the, the waters of Marah where they had to put the root down and make that bitter water sweet and Evelyn comes from a word that means lively and pleasant and so when God said rise up Mary Evelyn as a prophetic word what he was doing in my life taking me out of seas of bitterness and making me lively and pleasant in his presence and I want to sing that verse again I cannot deny what I've seen I've got no choice but to believe my doubts are burning oh like ashes to the wind Oh, so, so long to my old friends. Depression, oh, depression and bitterness. You can just keep on moving. No, you're not a welcome here. Oh, from now till I walk the streets of gold, I'll sing of how. Yeah. 
what love the Father has lavished upon us that we should be called the children of God. You've lavished your love upon us, God. You held nothing back. You paid the highest price so that we could come and live life to the fullest. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for how easy it is to love you and worship you. Be honored and glorified in this place. Amen. You may be seated. Morning, church. That's more like it. Uh, <laughs> welcome to uh, the service. We, at this time, we'd like to say thank you for all of us for worshiping today in person. And we will also would like to welcome those who are worshiping via internet with us. Today is Father's Day, so happy Father's Day to the fathers here in this room. It's kind of awkward for me when I walk into someone that said, Happy Father's Day. And I'm thinking, do they have kids? <laughs> so I don't want to say Happy Father's Day unless they have children too. So you got it. So we'd like to welcome everyone uh, who are worshiping with us today, especially, especially the first time guests. The first time guests. So at NECC, we believe in a process called Take Three. So if you come the first time, uh, we get to know you a little bit, you are still a guest. You come the second time, you are a guest, but I believe on the third, uh, the third time, you are family. Because as my family found out about a couple of years ago, at Northeast Christian Church, this is a place where you can count on God's presence. This is a place where you can count on a shoulder to cry on if you need one. This is a place where you can count on somebody to take you out to lunch if you need to. So you'll find a community in us. There's no perfect community, but with God's grace, who is perfected in us through Christ Jesus, you will find that a place where grace abounds, where forgiveness is found, where we relate to the Father who made us his children well. So happy Father's Day again to all the dads here. And in a, in a, in a, in a culture that is grappling with their sense of identity, looking to find who they are, I'd like to remind us, like we say, like we sing, Christ is our firm foundation, the rock on which we stand. Meaning, if God calls you to be a dad, this is exactly where he wants you to be. This is the exact role he wants you to play. And you can rest assured and, and stand on that foundation on which we can believe it. A couple of years ago, I was working with my son. Uh, we were going to IHOP for breakfast. We saw, uh, I pulled in the parking lot, and then I got out of the car, and he got my attention. He said, Daddy, is this a fast car? He pointed out to a red Maserati that was sitting in the parking lot, and he was only two or three years old at that time. And I couldn't believe it. I looked at him, I said, how did you realize this car is different than the others? <laughs> In his mind, he saw this vehicle is supposed to go fast. This is what I call intelligent design. If the person who made this red car designed that car to be on the beach, in the water, like a boat, my son would not have identified this car as something that needs to be fast. So the person, the engineers who made the car knew he designed something to be aerodynamic, to be lower to the ground, to go faster. So meaning, if you take this car, you launch it on the water, you are doing something what? You're destroying the car. Because the designer made it for a specific purpose for which it serves. Therefore, as fathers, as dad, God made us for a specific purpose in specific people's lives. And only us can play that role that's why he gives us that role. If you want the playbook, read the word, what God says about what he expects us to do as dad. With that said, happy Father's Day, and let me pray for us. Lord God, we thank you for your love for us. Thank you that while we were yet sinners, Christ, your son, your only son, your perfect son, died for us to reconcile us to you, 
who are lost, alienated by sin, enemies of God, and not children of God. But as your word says in John 1, but to those who receive them, he gave the power to become children of God. And thus, we are here today. Children of God, women of God, young men of God, old men of God, young women of God, and young toddlers of God. Because you reconciled us through you, through your son. So we ask today for those who may feel alienated from their earthly fathers that you would be the father that they need. We ask for those who had a great relationship with their fathers that this would be strengthened and be passed on. And those who inherited um, a sinful legacy from their dad that you would break that cycle today. That you would instill your foundation for fatherhood in those and let them end that and pass on a great legacy to their children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Pastor Dylan for the announcement. Thank you, Wilson. Thank you. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Pastor Dylan. I'm one of the pastors here, and I want to say how happy Father's Day to you. Somebody came up to me this morning and said, I want to prophesy into your future. Happy Father's Day. And I said, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> it's not happening anytime soon. <laughs> but uh, we're, we're grateful that we can take this time, celebrate fathers, celebrate family. I'm just going to continue with a couple of announcements as we look towards our worship through giving. Uh, next week, next Sunday, we have a leadership huddle. And this is a once a quarter event we have for all volunteers, all, all staff, everybody. If you serve in this church, this is something we would really appreciate your presence at. And this is at 6.30 p.m. next Sunday. Okay, so one week from today, we'll have our leadership huddle. We'll, we'll go over vision. We'll talk a little bit of strategy. This is an important thing to be at. We appreciate if you guys wouldn't mind making time for that. Even if you're stepping into serving and thinking, I want to serve more, this is a great place to be at. So we hope you can join us for that. And then next, we have a Kid Sunday coming up. Uh, it's a Sunday we'll retake every year to dedicate towards our children's ministry. So it's going to be a wild, fun Sunday. This is a time to invite some kids in your family. Let them have some fun. There might be destruction and mayhem going on. So kids, you not, they're not going to want to miss this service. Hopefully, no, no nobody's going to leave injured. So it's going to be a good time. We're looking forward to that. That is going to be on July 16th. It's about one month from today, July 16th. We're going to have kids Sunday. Children will be with us in service. It's going to be a great time. We're looking forward to that. Now as we look towards our giving, I'd like to remind you of uh, a little story in the Old Testament where I've been reading through Kings and uh, David towards the end of his life is making atonement for a sin and he comes to this vineyard and somebody offers it. He's like, you're the king. Take it all. You can sacrifice whatever you want. And David looks and he says, I will not offer God that which cost me nothing. And I thought so often of how we conduct our Christianity, and I hope that you and I would have a faith that costs us something. Otherwise, it's just words. And so I would invite you to join me in prayer as we look towards our giving. Uh, you can give through these lock boxes here. If you're online, you can hit the give button. You can do ne-cc.org backslash give. Or you can text the keyword N-E-C-C -C to the number 97,000. And we thank you for doing that. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the gift you gave us in your son. I pray that that gift would produce fruit 30, 60, and 100 fold in our hearts. And that what we give back to you wouldn't just be a one for one, but that we would give our all to you, God. And that it would be blessed. In Jesus' name, amen. Top of the morning to you. My name is Pastor Paul. Thank you for all of you who are visiting online, watching this later, all of you that are here on Father's Day. And uh, this is a special day. First of all, we are completely a Gentile church. We have two giant pigs roasting out there, which are not kosher. And uh, I will never give up my bacon, ever. Um, so it's, it's a great day. But on top of that, you may not have known this, but in the far back of the church, in the caged area is a mechanical bull. 
And um, I'm encouraging you, just get on that thing. If you have a pre-existing medical condition, please, you know, don't do that. If you're given to, if you're given to immaturity, please don't do that. But um, uh, I encourage you, get out there and ride the bull. And the reason why is because Sienna Limos, right now, a woman holds the record on Father's Day. With... No, please don't clap for that. So men, it's all in the hips. You just got to put your feet in the stirrups and we're going we're gonna to try and take that record back and ride the bull for the glory of God. Um, we are picking up next week our series on the Holy Spirit. We talked about the gifts of the Spirit. I'll be picking up on that in chapter 14, the first half of that, verse 25. And uh, how many of you felt like that that was a really rational walk through the topic and it was just kind of laying it out clearly? And, and so um, we, we're going to continue with that and let Scripture do the talking for us. We, we embrace God's presence, God's miraculous gifts in this church, and we see them at work. But um, God is a practical God. He's also a providential God, and sometimes he's a supernatural God. And so we, we, we don't want to ignore that, and uh, only he can make that happen. And so we want to we be eagerly desiring all the gifts that God has for us. It's my privilege today, though, to have a break as a father. My son said to me, Dad, it's because of me that you have this day to celebrate. And I said, no, it's because of your mom. And it, you wouldn't be here without us. So uh, on Father's Day today, uh, I've, I've asked for Sean Cooper to come and join us. He is a dear friend. I've known him for uh, as longer than anyone here, actually. We grew up one town away from each other. I was prof his professor at Bible College. He has served in the military as a soldier, as a vet in the Marine Corps, and is now with the Navy. His beautiful wife, Amy, his wonderful three children have good Irish names, uh, Elowen, Braylon, and Cormac. We actually, our families come from about uh, 50 miles away from each other, where my family's from Rothcommon, Sligo County, that, that area, his are from Cork. And uh, I asked him to come up here and give us a good Father's Day Irish message. And so if you get ready for a little rebellion here, we're going to get crazy. All right, we're going to do it Irish style here. Get ready to have your hair blown back to the glory of God. McCulloch. <laughs> He's all man, and this is the right guy for this great father, great man, great man of God. I mean that with all my heart. God bless you, Sean. Thanks, Pastor Paul. Thank you. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to play a couple of tunes for you. <laughs> Thank you very much. If you have auditory issues, if you don't do well with uh, crazy sounds like bagpipes, please, no offense if you excuse yourself for a moment. I'm just going to play two tunes, uh, and then at the end of the service, I'll play one more tune. But if uh, you have some auditory issues, please feel free to excuse yourself. It's a little overwhelming, and uh, head out into the foyer and come on back when the music stops. <laughs> well, it's bagpipes. I don't know if it's music. <laughs> uh, you going to turn off the mic while I play so we don't pick it up? You're good. Thanks. Quick intro of the tunes. I'm going to play two. One is The Minstrel Boy, traditional Irish tune. I'm going to play it for my father, who can't be with us. He passed away when I was uh, 18 years old. Uh, it was one of his favorite Irish tunes. It's a story about a young man in ancient Ireland that goes off to war to fight for the freedom of Ireland from the Anglo-Saxon invasion. And uh, he, the story goes that he takes his father's sword with him into battle and he takes his harp as well, harp being a traditional symbol of Ireland. Um, he takes his harp and unfortunately he falls in the battle, receives a mortal wound, and his last dying words is that he will no longer allow his harp to be played in slavery. And he tears the strings from the harp saying it will only ever be played in freedom. Uh, and since he won't live long enough to see that freedom come, he'll tear the strings from the harp and no longer allow it to be played in slavery. That the music of his harp is not fit for those who would seek to invade his country. Uh, and the second tune I like to play is Amazing Grace. And I'm going to play Amazing Grace because uh, I, have a, I have a very positive message about Father's Day today, a very positive message about men in general today, uh, but I need to 
we need to take a moment, I think, I think it's right, take a moment to just acknowledge the fact that there are many fathers that can't be with us today, to play Amazing Grace in honor of those fathers, uh, as well as to acknowledge the grief and loss that many of us feel because we never had a good relationship with our father. We never had the type of relationship we were meant to have, and that can be a real sense of grief and loss. And so to play Amazing Grace for that as well, like I said, my father died when I was 18, and I never really had a good relationship with him. Uh, He never did anything wrong, uh, just never had a good relationship with him, and he died before I really had a chance to reconcile and to see past him and see into his own childhood and the extremely messed up, hurtful, damaging childhood he had which probably contributed to the type of relationship that he and I had. So I never had a chance to see past that and reconcile with him. Uh, but I feel like now, through the grace of God and through great input from good friends and family, that I now really can see past that and love and accept my father for who he is uh, and forgive him. So Minstrel Boy for my dad, his favorite Irish tune, Amazing Grace for all the dads that can't be with us, as well as for the loss that you may have felt in your life because you never had the type of relationship with your father you were meant to have. And if that's you, I encourage you, please reach out to a good Christian friend or mentor that can work with you through that, hopefully come to a place where you can uh, forgive your dad and just accept who he was for who he was and put it in God's hands. But... Thank you. I hope it was a blessing to you to hear that as it was a blessing to me to play it. So, uh, like I said, this morning we're going to talk about fatherhood, talk about manhood. And as a caveat to that, I fully acknowledge and admit there are lots of men and lots of fathers out there that don't do the job that God gave them to do. And it causes them a lot of damage. It causes people and society a lot of damage. So this sermon is in no way to excuse or minimize or gloss over any of that. However... If you follow the news, you will see there's a lot of negativity about everybody these days. Men, women, fathers, mothers, take your pick. So in that vein, uh, it being Father's Day, I'm going to preach a positive message about fathers and about men. And I have here my carefully prepared sermon notes. But right before I came up to the platform, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and gave me an entirely new message.
Just kidding, I need these. <laughs> no, I need those. It says here at this point, throw away message, and I, I can't do that. So, all right, so um, uh, a real man knows when not to take himself too seriously, right? Am I right? Um, I, I totally forgot my Bible. Pastor Paul, can I borrow yours? You have your Bible on you? Do you have a physical Bible there? Oh, thank you, Derek. Awesome. So I, just, I, just, I was going to say, if not Pastor Paul, then please, one of the brothers, let me have their Bible. Thank you. Okay, so, all right, let's see. Derek, this Bible doesn't make any sense. There's all these words look like they're upside down. What's wrong with your Bible? Oh, turn it over. Oh, there we go. Oh, thank you. A real man knows when to ask for help. <laughs> And knows when to take instruction from another man, from a brother in Christ. Thank you. But, <laughs> again, I do, the, I do those jokes to lead up to the fact, yeah, I'm going to talk about fatherhood. I'm going to talk about masculinity. I don't want to get any ideas. Anyone here is thinking I'm saying that, you know, we need the uh, 1980s superhero action flick type of masculinity, and that's all there is one masculinity. I think that's a great aspect of masculinity, that Rambo type, that Rocky type. I think that's, that is a good and positive aspect of masculinity. But if we only look at that, just that one part, it's very one-dimensional, right? Men are human beings like anybody else. We're multi-dimensional creatures. We can't look at just one representation of it, okay? The Rambo image and the Rocky image made a lot of money for Hollywood back in the 80s, and now I don't, I don't know what's making a lot of money for Hollywood these days when it comes to how they portray men. But anyway, remember, Hollywood's just out there to make money, and that's all they exist for. I read a verse, I think a couple years ago, and I just thought it was so good, and I thought, there's something here. There's really something here, and I put it in my pocket, and I held on to it, and then when Pastor Paul asked me to preach a few weeks ago, um, I thought, this is the time to use this verse. So I've taken a lot of time. I've looked into it, uh, just mold on it and let it try to guide me. So this is chapter 10 of Exodus. Verse 8 is where I'm going to start. Well, verse 7. Let's start off in verse 7. Why not? Um, this is after the eight plagues. So we are in the story of Exodus were eight plagues into the ten plagues of Egypt, okay? The eighth one just finished. There's only two left, the plague of darkness and the plague of death. Those are the only ones left in the story, okay? We've already been through this amazing, harrowing experience for the people of God as God is working to show his power over the powers of this earth through the ten plagues. We're eight deep. Pharaoh's officials... Come now to Pharaoh and appeal to him. How long will you let this man hold us hostage? Let the men go to worship their Lord, their God. Don't you realize that Egypt lies in ruins? So Moses and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh. All right, go and worship the Lord, your God. But who exactly will be going with you? Moses replied, we will all go. Young and old, our sons and our daughters, our flocks and our herds. We must all join together in celebrating a festival to the Lord. Pharaoh retorted, The Lord will certainly need to be with you if I let you take your little ones. I can see through your evil plan. Never! Only the men may go and worship the Lord since that is what you requested. And Pharaoh threw them out of the palace, didn't even give them a chance to response. And then if you continue reading in the Exodus story, you know the next part, the next two plagues come, and eventually, surprise, God's people win, <laughs> and Pharaoh loses. All right, but I thought this was great. Who will be going with you? Well, all of us. All of us. No, no. You can take the men, and that's the way my translation reads it. This one is really good too. I can see through evil. Never. Only the men may go. Only the men may go. What, what is going on there? Why would he let the men go? What did Pharaoh want? And that's the title of my sermon today. What did Pharaoh want? What did he want? What is going on here? And I think the answer, uh, I've been listening 
a lot to a podcast called The Bible Project. So far, so good. Nothing crazy coming out of The Bible Project, guys, as far as I can tell. Um, Pastor Paro is far more of a biblical scholar than I am, so if you hear something on The Bible Project that sounds a little fishy, talk to Pastor Paul. But so far, so good. Nothing crazy out of these guys, um, even though they're West Coasters. <laughs> Lord, we love our brothers and sisters on the West Coast. <laughs> we do, we do, but I say that tongue-in-cheekly. Serve with a lot of great Marines from the West Coast. Um, anyway, what did Pharaoh want out of letting the men go? What is going on here? That doesn't make any sense when you really think about it. The Hebrew people are what to Pharaoh? Slaves, building cities, building buildings. I mean, they're all enslaved. So the women are definitely doing some kind of work, but who's doing probably the majority of the physical labor, like lifting blocks and laying foundations and carving wood, carving stone? It's the, it's the men. It's the men doing it. That's who it is. Why would he give up this workforce and go out into the desert? Well, the Bible Project guys, like I said, they're great. They're, one of their reoccurring themes is everything in the Bible is hyperlinked. It's all connected. It's all meant to be connected. The Bible was not written like we write our modern 21st century Western textbooks and history books where it's like a steady march, A, B, C, D, and you're not really meant to think about what happened in the past when you're reading something. You're not really meant to think about you know, George Washington when you're reading about the War of 1812. You're not really meant to think about um, the, the men of the 54th Massachusetts, which was an all-black regiment during the Civil War. You're not meant to think about them when you're reading about the Tuskegee Airmen, who, which, which were the uh, all-black fighter pilots of World War II. All right, our history's not written like that. It's all, like, compartmentalized. Uh, but the Bible's not. It's meant to all be connected. So, when Pharaoh says this, let the men go, what is Pharaoh doing? I thought to myself, what's going on? What does he want? And then I think, well, let's look at other parts of the story. And we look back to Pharaoh's father. We assume it's Pharaoh's father. We know that by the time Moses came back, the Lord says to him, all the men who wanted you are now dead. So we're assuming that the Pharaoh that was in power when, Pharaoh, when uh, uh, Moses was a younger man and killed the Egyptian we're assuming that Pharaoh's now dead and that this Pharaoh who Moses is confronting is that man's son. So we look back to Pharaoh's father, the Pharaoh of Moses' youth, and what did he do? He ordered the death of all the baby boys in Egypt, all the baby Hebrew boys. The Jewish people have already been enslaved by this point. He's already made them slaves, and he said, let's work them hard because we're worried about these people becoming too powerful. And if we're invaded by a foreign country, these Hebrew people living among us who worship a different God than us, they might turn against us. So let's make them slaves. We'll make them work for us. And he makes them slaves, but God's people prosper under persecution. God's people always prosper when the heat's on. So the Jewish people continue to prosper. One of the greatest signs of prosperity back then was children, children being born and growing to adulthood. So the Jewish families continued to multiply and get bigger. So this is a sign of divine blessing in the eyes of the ancient world. So Pharaoh says, this, these people are getting stronger, even though we've enslaved them. We're making them work for us. What are we going to do now? I know what we're going to do. Let's kill the baby boys. We don't know how long Pharaoh wanted to do this plan for, because originally he tried to enlist the help of two Egyptian midwives, which this was a great point. Let me just segue on this really quick. We don't know which Pharaoh we have in this story. We don't know the, his name. I know that the great movie with Charlton Heston and Yul Brenner will tell you it was Ramesses. And one day, what's funny, I was reading the biblical text to my kids, and they were like, uh, my daughter Braylon said, which, uh, which pharaoh was it? And Elwin's like, oh, I know, it was Ramesses. I'm like, who told you that? It's like, oh, it's, it's in that animated movie. I forget the name of it now. So um, P Prince of Egypt, I think, right? Yeah, thank you. I'm like, well... Great point. It might have been Ramses, but we don't know because the biblical author does not tell us the name of this evil 
oppressive, power-hungry, earthly dictator. But the biblical author does tell us the names of these two Egyptian midwives. I won't try and pronounce their names. <laughs> but the biblical author tells us the names of these two nobodies. These two nobodies, these two Egyptian midwives, he tells us their names. Why does he tell us their names? Because they were people of God who stood up against a tyrant and refused to obey his evil commands. When you are a power-hungry, evil-hearted, corrupt dictator, chances are your name will be thrown into the dustbin of history, and people will forget about you long after you are dead and gone. But when you are a person of God and you follow his ways, maybe you won't get your name written down in the Bible, but your name will be remembered, not the name of those evil, power-hungry dictators. Which is a great message because Pharaoh was God on earth. And Pharaoh had his name carved into every brick and stone in Egypt and probably had cities named after him. And no one knows his name. That's how much disdain the biblical author has for this chump. <laughs> he didn't even record that man's name. He recorded the names of these two Egyptian midwives. So Pharaoh says to the Egyptian midwives, I want you, when the baby boys are born, to kill them. Like, no, we're not going to do that. And they refuse. And then God blesses them with their own families. So we don't know how many generations Pharaoh was willing to kill these baby boys. So the next thing happens is he sends his soldiers out and he uses them instead. So he was willing to kill the baby boys. Remember, we're looking at the Pharaoh Moses confronting. He's willing to let the men go. Go back in time, his father was willing to kill off a portion of his future workforce. He was willing to say, you know what, these, these baby boys, they might grow up and to be men one day, and they're going to do most of the labor I need done, but guess what, I'd rather risk losing some of that labor to kill them off while they're young. Why is that? Well, because those baby boys become men, and men become fathers. And if you can eliminate the fathers, you can do what you want with what's left. No one's there to stop you, really. Now, I'm not saying women can't protect their families. I'm not in no way saying that. Remember, I'm not trying to say that one gender is superior to the other. I'm not saying that. I'm just trying to say, like, one has one role and one has another role. And it really seems clear that the role of a father is to protect and provide. Protect and provide is the role of a father. What is a father? There's a lot of ways to define it and talk about it, but I really think that probably one of the easiest things to say, what is a father from all cultures and all time periods around the world? A father is someone who protects and provides in whatever way that they can. My ancestors killed bears and lions. I never have. I don't have to protect my family by killing bears and lions. <laughs> all right? I'm still a protector. My ancestors provided for their families by building houses with their bare hands and tools made from stone. I never have. I probably couldn't. I can barely put together a tree house, <laughs> which is my big project I've been working on now for like six months. <laughs> but I'm, I still provide for my family in my own way. You don't need to be some six-foot-six muscle-bound lumberjack to protect and provide for your family. Nor do you need to be some mild-mannered librarian-type person to protect and provide for your family. You can protect and provide for your family in a lot of different ways. But if you get rid of the baby boys, you get rid of the future men. And if you get rid of the future men, you get rid of the future fathers. And once you get rid of the fathers, you can do what you want with the rest. And that's what Pharaoh wanted. He wanted to do what he wanted with the rest. He knew that by sending his soldiers down into the Hebrew sections of his kingdom and killing the baby boys, that he might lose a workforce, but he would gain a controlled and subjugated population. Because he knew that not only was he killing the future men and fathers, but the fathers of that day 
would be defeated in their spirit. Because as the soldiers were coming and killing the baby boys, they had to make a choice. Do we rise up and fight back and risk my entire family being killed? Or do I just let this happen? And maybe some did fight back, but it seems like probably they didn't because there was no great slave uprising at that time. Pharaoh got away with it. He got away with his plan. And he knew, this is, what, this is just my opinions. A lot of this is some of my opinions, okay? There's no, like, secret message in the back of the Bible that says <laughs> everything that I'm saying. But I really think that Pharaoh knew that if he could get away with killing off a portion of his future workforce, that the fathers of that day wouldn't give him any more trouble. They would have been beaten in their spirit. They would have had to live with the guilt and the burden for the rest of their lives, knowing that there came a time when they were not able to protect their families. They weren't able to protect their baby boys. They weren't able to protect them. They had to make a choice. They were going to sacrifice their baby boys to save the rest of their family. That was the choice they had to make. They couldn't protect their families. And then Pharaoh is very clearly saying, listen, not only Hebrew fathers can you not protect your families, but I am the provider for your families. You are slaves. You don't produce anything for yourself. You don't make anything for yourself. You have no sovereignty. You have no autonomy. You have nothing. I provide everything for you, Hebrew fathers. I am Pharaoh. I am God. You can't protect your families. Only I can. And you can't provide for your families. Only I can. And so the whole generation of Hebrew fathers had to grow up with that knowledge, knowing I can't do the job that God gave me to do. And the Hebrew boys would have looked at their Hebrew fathers and seen a defeated, subjugated man, and the best person to teach a boy to be a man is another man. And the best person to teach a boy to be a man of God is a man of God. Now, I'm not saying that single mothers can't do a really great job, and I'm not saying single mothers can't do a good job trying to raise their boys, and I'm not saying that, you know, female teachers and Sunday school teachers and things like that can't do a great job teaching little boys how to be, how to follow God's laws. But a carpenter can't teach you to be a brain surgeon. A brain surgeon can't teach you to be a carpenter. A woman cannot teach a boy how to be a man. Only a man can. A man of God will teach a boy how to be a man of God. So those Hebrew boys of Moses' generation, the example of manhood they had to look to was a generation of men that had been made very, very clear to them, they could not protect and provide. Pharaoh had a long-term plan. He was building a legacy of dominance over the Hebrew people by attacking the fathers, by attacking the men. And like I said, I'm not saying that women do not have a special, unique, and powerful role to play in God's kingdom. As we see here, those two Egyptian midwives have their names mentioned. Pharaoh's name is not mentioned. The two Egyptian midwives have their names mentioned even before the names of Moses' father and mother are mentioned in the biblical text. So I'm not saying anything negative about women, but I am talking about men today. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, we have Father's Day, Mother's Day for a reason, right? Two days. So. Um, so, Pharaoh, he had a plan. He had a long-term plan. Fast forward to Moses' day, and now we have that Pharaoh's son looking at what? Looking at what? Looking at this powerful, confident, defiant 
man of God standing before him saying, Let my people go! And Pharaoh must have been thinking, What? How did one slip through the cracks? We had a plan for this. My dad made sure that a man like you would never stand here in front of me defying my power. We're eight plagues into this nonsense and I'm still dealing with this. You weren't supposed to exist, Moses. A powerful, confident, defiant man of God standing in front of me. I am God on earth. How dare you? The schemes of man will be thwarted by the power of God. So, Pharaoh's looking at exactly what his father feared the most. Powerful, confident, defiant man of God screaming in his face, let my people go, backed up by the raw power of almighty creator of the universe, tearing Egypt down brick by brick. The officials told Pharaoh, we are in ruins. Remember how you were afraid the Hebrew people might rebel against us if an enemy came and attacked us and then we'd be too weak to beat them both? Well, guess what? If an enemy came and attacked us now, never mind the Hebrew rebellion, we're already too weak. Egypt's in ruins. That's where Pharaoh is. The very thing he tried to prevent, the potential conquest of his nation is now exactly what he's facing down because his father's plan to get rid of the men and to get rid of the fathers failed. And we have a powerful, confident, defiant man of God staring him down saying, let my people go. And so Pharaoh falls into the plans of his father and says, if I can just get rid of the men, I can do what I want with the rest. My dad took a small step by trying to get rid of future men and subjugating the current men, but if I can just get the men to go away, I can do what I want with the rest of them. So he says, you can go. Take the men. Take the men? Again, that makes no sense on the surface because what are the Hebrews? They're slaves for hard labor. They're not IT guys. <laughs> and I'm not saying IT guys can't be, you know, buff and strong. Okay, I'm not saying by any means. But Pharaoh needs these slaves for hard labor. They're not fine craftsmen. They're not building microchips in a lab. He needs strong powerful, physically strong men to build his palaces and cities in the desert brick by brick. He definitely needs a strong male slave force to rebuild Egypt after it's been laid waste through the plagues. He's like, you know what? I'll take the risk. Take the men. Because he knows that once the men leave... He can do what he wants with the rest. The boys will have no one to look up to. The little girls will have no one to look up to. The Hebrew women will probably be forced to become concubines of the Egyptian men. And Pharaoh will begin to breed a half-caste stratus- stratum of his society. Just more people he can enslave. The little boys, he can just say, hey... You got two choices. You can become an Egyptian soldier in my army or you can just continue being a slave. There's no one around here to teach you how to be a man except for my men. There's no one here to teach you to be a man except for the men who worship pagan gods and say to the little girls, hey, you know, because little girls will oftentimes seek out to marry the kind of men they have involved in their life when they're little girls. So, hey, guess what, little girls... When you grow up, you can marry someone who worships the pagan gods. Or you can grow up to marry one of these little boys that grew up in to be a Hebrew male slave. And then the women, like I said, they'd probably just become concubines. 
And so Pharaoh knew that if he let the men go and the men went out in the desert, they might just decide to stay out there in the desert and go away. Not a problem. Or if the men decided to go out, change their minds and come back, it'd be too late by then. The damage would be done. Their women would have been taken and their children would have been given to somebody else. Pharaoh thought, if I can just get rid of the men, I'm willing to lose the hard labor slave force for a little while because I'll make some really big future gains. Take the men. Leave the women and children. The old phrase is women and children first, right? The Titanic. Great stories. Great stories of manhood on the Titanic. Do a little bit of research. You'll see multiple stories of many men just giving up their life jackets to the women and children. The men in the band, they just played until the end. One man's famous for saying, oh, the ship's sinking. I'm going to dress in my very finest clothes and sit here and enjoy a drink and smoke a cigar, and that's it, and give up his seat to somebody else. Were there tales of cowardice? Yes, of course. I'm sure there were. But women and children first, Pharaoh was hoping Moses never heard that phrase. <laughs> he was wrong. Pharaoh knew that a generation without fathers, he knew what we now know because of modern science. And I won't read off a bunch of stats to you because I thought that'd be pretty boring. <laughs> but if you do a little bit of research, you'll find out the stats are there. Two great resources I came across was the National, Father, the National Institute for Fatherhood and Focus on the Family. Focus on the Family is a faith-based organization. Lots of good resources, not just for uh, fathers, Christian fathers, Christian families. So great places to go. And they have a lot of stats and data there. But Pharaoh knew that a generation of boys and girls without fathers are more likely to have behavioral problems, psychological problems. They're more likely to become pregnant before marriage as teens. They're more likely to get into addiction. They're more likely to go to jail. They're more likely to commit crimes. They're more likely to fail out of school. They're more likely to wind up in dead-end jobs. They're more likely to repeat problems of past generations, Pharaoh knew if he could just get rid of the men, get rid of the fathers, I can do what I want with the rest. I'll have it all. Drives Moses from his presence. And then it's game on. Two more plagues and that was it. Pharaoh's regime, Pharaoh's power was toppled. Pharaoh tried to go for the men. He tried to go for the fathers, just like his own father did. Try and go for the men. Try and go for the fathers. He knew if he could destroy the fatherhood of a nation, he could destroy the nation. That generation of Hebrew men knew what was at stake. The men of Moses' generation knew what was at stake. The biblical narrative makes it pretty clear that a lot of times whenever e Pharaoh would say something to Moses, word would get around the Hebrew camp pretty quickly, like the people would find out what was going on. So the biblical narrative doesn't tell us that Moses and the men get together and the men all refuse to go without their families, but I have to imagine that word probably got around that there was this option on the table. There was an option on the table. You can go, leave everybody else. But the Hebrew men of Moses' day knew that they had more than that as an option. The men of Moses' father's generation, they didn't have an option. They had to watch their families be destroyed. The men of Moses' generation had an option. They had an option to provide and to protect for their families by refusing to leave and by waiting and praying, waiting on the Lord, waiting on God to make his next move. We're eight plagues in. The men of Moses' generation knew they had an option that their fathers didn't have, and that was just to wait for God to make his move and to provide and to protect their families and their communities. 
They didn't have to quit. They didn't have to give up. They didn't have to go away. They didn't have to fail. They didn't have to stumble. They had to trust in God. And they said, no. The power of no. Will you go without your families? No. Will you surrender your families to me? No. Will you give up? No. Will you give in? No. The option of no. The option of no. That's sometimes all it is. A godly, confident, powerful, defiant man standing in the face of an earthly power. The earthly power of Moses' day was Pharaoh. The earthly powers of our day, take your pick. I'm not going to start naming names. I'm not going to do that. You're welcome. I'm not going to start naming names. I'm st- today, I'm just sticking to the scrip- scripture. Just sticking to what the Bible tells us. The earthly powers of today, though, are saying the same message that Pharaoh said. If I can just get rid of the men, if I can just get rid of the fathers, I can do what I want with the rest. And the men of our generation, for the sake of our families and the sake of our communities and the sake of our churches, you may not be a father today, you may not be a father yet, you might never be a father, I don't know. There's no shame in never producing children. If you never become a father, there's nothing in the Bible that says that you're less of a man than anybody else. But the men of a community are called to be the providers and the protectors. The men of the community are called to be involved with the children of the community. Oh, right, that was a great song. (laughs) Men, we have the option to say no. We have the option to say no. The men of Moses' generation had that option. We have that option to just simply say no and defy the powers of this world and say, no, you can't have our families. You can't have our women and children. You can't have our communities. You can't have our church. No. Men of the church, please stand up. I'd like to ask the men of the church to stand up. Men of the church. Yeah, come on. Come on, brothers. Stand up. I know. Men of the church. Thank you. Men of the church, men of the church, whether you're fathers in the biological sense or just fathers in the spiritual sense to our church and to our community, I'm going to ask you a series of questions and I want to hear your answer. I want to hear your answer. No, that's right, Joe. Exactly. Men of the church, are you going to give up? Are you going to give up? Are you going to let go? Are you going to go away? Are you going to give in? Are you going to surrender? Are you going to stop? No. Let's hear it again. Are you going to surrender? No. Thank you, brothers. Thank you, brothers. Thank you, brothers. So we talked a little bit about Pharaoh. He is a power of this world. We talked about what Pharaoh and the powers of this world want to do. They want to get rid of the men. They want to get rid of the fathers. That's what they want to do. They want to destroy that. Why? Because they know that once they do that, they can do whatever they want with the rest. There's very little defense. There's very little defense stopping them from doing whatever they want next. Okay? We learned what the men of Moses' generation could do. They could just say no. 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 No, 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 no. Absolutely not. No. Any other language you want to say it in? No. Do you have another language? Go ahead, Junior. What is it? All right. What else, What other languages we got here? No. Huh? Where? Thank you. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Whatever language you need to say it in. Nine and yet are two of my favorites. I say it to my kids. Like, what's that? I'm like, that's German and Russian. Like, who taught you German and Russian? Like, nobody. (laughs) I don't know German and Russian. (laughs) Like, my dad told me those words. (laughs) 
Um, our answer is no. Now, I'm going to give some practical steps and advice, some practical takeaways, and then I'm going to finish us with uh, another bagpipe tune, and then uh, I think Pastor Dylan has some announcements for us. Is that, is that appropriate? Oh, that's a, all right, there we go. Awesome. So, some practical steps. First of all, fathers, men, be involved in your children's education. Be involved in your children's education. Whatever that education is, be involved in it. Be involved in it. Be involved in it. Listen, there's a great story about Yellowstone and about the wolves of Yellowstone, if you haven't heard it. They reintroduced wolves to Yellowstone many years ago, and the mere presence of the wolves in Yellowstone began to bring balance to the ecosystem. Look it up. It's a great story. Just the presence of the wolves began to make the ecosystem of Yellowstone work properly again. Just the presence of men, godly men, godly men will begin to bring balance to a family, to a church, to a society. Be engaged. So, be engaged in your children's education, whatever that looks like for you. You homeschool, you private school, charter school, public school, whatever it is, there's no one-size-fits-all for any family. My family and I, we homeschool because we're able to. It's a good fit for us. I was homeschooled. It was a good fit for me. It may not be a good fit for you and your family, but what is a good fit for you and your family is fathers be involved in your children's education. Fathers be involved in your children's spiritual education as well. Whatever that looks like for you, be involved in the spiritual education of your children. What it looks like for me and my family is that we read a scripture, we read a Bible story every night at dinner. We sing a hymn or a song of some kind. I ask the kids a couple of Bible questions. I give them a chance to ask me Bible questions, and then we read another Bible story at bedtime. <laughs> and and we, um, and we just, I try to make time to talk about the scripture when possible. So be involved in the children's spiritual education, okay? And then just be involved in your children's lives. Be involved in your children's lives, fathers. Whatever way you can, whatever way you can. And not every father has the same abilities, the same time, the same opportunities. It all looks different. But just remember the wolves of Yellowstone. Just be present in the lives of your children. And for those who are not fathers or for those who are fathers, listen, this is our community, this church. This is our community. Be involved with the children of this church. Find a way to be involved with the children of our church. Your presence makes their lives better. The same way a woman's life makes a child's life better, a man's life makes a child's life better too. Be involved with the education and care for the children here as well. Volunteer in kids' church. Volunteer with the little ones. Volunteer with the older ones. Volunteer with the teenagers. Maybe you don't like to teach. Maybe you can just be there. Maybe you're good at setting up games. Maybe you're good at just giving them a high five as they come into children's church. You know, whatever it is, just be involved with the kids somehow. We need your help. Men, we need you. We need you, men. We need you, fathers. We do. God needs you. God needs women, too. The church needs women, too. I'm not saying we don't, but today the message is men and fathers. We need you. So, say no. Say no. Say no. Uh, I'm going to play a tune for us. It's called, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. You may or may not remember that song from years ago. The fount of every blessing is God and fathers and men are a blessing to a church, to a community, and to a family.
That is called testosterone in a skirt. <laughs> I just want to uh, uh, share some thoughts, and then we have some instruction for you. But um, I was just reading in the paper the other day, and uh, I, I was looking at places across the country where it's the most hostile for Christianity. And um, Massachusetts is one of the leading ones. Uh, New Mexico, um, Nevada, and, and uh, different places. But when, when they were talking about, they weren't like not open to, but just downright hostile. And uh, maybe if you're watching this right now online, maybe in the future, or maybe you're here today, and you're not, um, you're not a follower of Christ. Christianity is a newer thing, and you're trying to figure this out. Can, I, I just want to say something against the backdrop of our culture. You, a message like this you could hear and just be like, this is so misogynistic. Uh, now, I remember the day where the macho man kind of image was out there, and yet the same macho man that was being venerated with the nice car and the big muscles and that was going home and beating their wife. You know, like the, the, there's, that's just disgusting. And yet, in the culture that we live in today, uh, maybe you're not a follower of Christ and there's confusion. You're trying to figure things out. Where do I, where do I fit? I, I just want to say a couple of things to this. First of all, if you are not a follower of Christ, it's, it's my job to show you Jesus, not to fight with somebody on whether what their choices are, right or wrong. And I just say that to you as believers in this church. It's, it's not our position to do that. We, we need to adorn Christ and, and do it. But let me... Let me just say something. At the same time, when you have someone share like this in the culture, in this state, it almost seems like, wow, that's a little over the top. But in right now in a state where legally people are changing their genders or whatever, notice that one of the steps with that process is hormone treatment. You, you literally need to introduce something that's not naturally in that person and you introduce hormone therapy. And, and here's the thing, you know, in the, the, the sixties or the seventies or the eighties or every generation is looking for the right things in all the wrong places. I think that people are looking to, to say, what am I? Who am I? Where do I fit? How do I belong? And we're going we're gonna to talk about this topic in the fall. I think it's, it's something that every single one of us engage with and deal with in our life, our culture, our friendships. But at the same time, the Lord, if you're a Christian, the Lord said that he made man and woman, and he made them in their image. Uh, if you think that uh, femininity is weakness, then uh, you have not met Irish women. <laughs> In fact, they were so crazy, they would fight with the men and were the only nation that drove Rome back. They said, they're nuts, build a wall, leave them be. Um, you have never met my friend Kyle Coco, who was one of the top hep keto masters in the world. She was the top female fighter. She was so good at fighting that she couldn't even compete with men. She could only compete with men because she was so incredibly fast, so incredibly powerful. She got hit, kicked in the back of her head and literally suffered memory loss. It was like she'd watch videos of herself, but she could never do any of that stuff again. It was a very unique thing in, in her life. But when Sean talks about that idea of being a defender, God says, I, I will fight on behalf of Israel. It's, it's in our blood. Whether you're a man or woman, it is in, in your blood. But, but men, I, I, just, I just tell you, you know what? The, the, the time has come for us to say no and not say nothing. How many homes have been ruined because there was a father that just sat there and instead of saying something, just watched it all happen? And we're not encouraging to, to create the world uh, I'm trying to land this in the right spot because I understand the culture that we're in, but it's sad that on Mother's Day we could celebrate femininity and we can celebrate ladies and there's no flinch. But I think the pause that we get when, when manhood 
shows itself in all of its strength and the culture responds with pause, I think it shows just how far we've drifted from being what God's called us to be. It's not my blood to walk away and watch innocents suffer. It's not my blood. It's not my blood to ignore my children. I spend time with them. I talk with them when they're not playing video games and they're not. But the Apostle Paul said it like this. You have many teachers among you, but you do not have many fathers. And it is never too late for you to become the person you were supposed to be. Maybe in this room, there are fathers, you're estranged to your kids. You walked away. Maybe you walked into a new life and a new marriage. I mean, I, I, I don't know what, what the circumstances are that surround here. Maybe you're, you're a man and you're kind of saying to yourself, I just don't feel right. Uh, maybe I'm not a man. You know, it, it, the Bible lays out very clearly these things. And, and this is where we need one another. This is where we need a brotherhood surrounding each other and celebrating that strength. God, God made man and woman in his image. And it doesn't mean that meekness is weakness. It doesn't mean that you have to be running around looking for a fight. But Moses said this. He said in that same passage a little further, he says this. He says, either all of us go or none of us go. Men, it if there's any responsibility that probably any woman would want you to do is to take the lead with them, take the reins with them and say, we are going to be a home of God. We are gonna be a home of strength. We are gonna be a home that is protected. We are gonna be a home of God's word. We're gonna be a home of God's will. There's no woman whether God has made them strong like my friend Kyle or maybe you are um, you're, you're a very gentle soul, there's no woman in the world that would not follow that. And I think that's where we've done the most damage is that we've been brutal with manhood instead of battling the things that seek to destroy the home. That's exactly what this message is about. Say no. Say no. No to passively sitting back. No to keeping quiet when I need to stand, say something. No to being absent when I need to be present. Every single one of us, every single one of us, there's no, if you men, men love their wives as Christ loved the church, there is not a single woman that I know of, however strong or however gentle, would not follow that type of leadership. So Lord, I just thank you today for the truth and the strong truth. I pray that in, Lord, we're in enemy territory here. We're in a place where uh, you're not calling us to walk around and tell the world everything they're doing wrong. You're, you're calling us to show them who Jesus is. And you can begin to help them and to help us help other people guide them but Lord, there's, there is such a distortion of manhood in our culture that it makes a strong display, a truthful, honest display of it, make people pause. And I, I just pray that you would, you would put the warrior back in the men of this church. You would put the defender in the men of this church. You would, you would help us to rise up and to rise out and to be somebody that would say, I'm safe and I'm going in the right direction following that man. And Lord, in Jesus' name, I pray that you would make men of purity in this church. I just, I just feel like saying this right now. If you're here and you're in a relationship with somebody and you are not married to them, she is not yours. Do not touch her. Stop touching our daughters. If you're here and you're a young lady in your relationship and you're pushing that relationship physical because you want it to stick and you want it to work, he is not yours. He is not your son. Stop touching them. It's time that the church, that we have strong, holy, godly, confident 
men and women of God worth following. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I, I'm, Lord, I just, uh, I pray this section here of what I just shared stands alone. And that truth that was preached for us to say, no, the time has come for us to take a stand. It's n that it would not be in our blood to surrender our homes to slavery, to surrender our children to slavery, to surrender our lives and spiritual and educational growth of our children to slavery. But at the same time, Lord, I pray that we would recapture godly manhood in a way that strong women would be able to look at that and say, I can follow a man like that. Lord, give us a reboot in our life. Give us a fresh start, a new beginning this morning to be that man by your grace and your help and your hope. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Thank you for being with us today. Be sure to listen to all our messages on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. And follow us on ne-cc.org for all information and updates. Thank you. God bless. Have a great day.